Hi everyone, um, my name is Tala. I live in Northampton. I've been in Northampton for 12 years. I did not come to the States as a refugee. Um, my, I was born in Iraq and my family left when I was three um, during the Iraq Iran War. Um, lived in London for a few months. I don't remember much, I was three. And then um, uh, moved to Michigan and I moved here to Northampton about 12 years ago. Um, I'm Chaldean Iraqi and um, I'm just here sort of add another voice and ask, answer questions that people may have and, um, and that might come up. Good. Hi, my name is Zaydun al Mamouri. Uh, I'm from Iraq. I have been here for about like four years and a half. So, and this year I'll be qualified to apply for citizenship and I'm so excited for that. Uh, yeah, and I got here by SIV, this is special immigrant visa. This is only for the people who used to work with the United States government. <clears throat> so I used to work with them in 2007 uh, for like about four years. And then I'm here. I'm married. I have two girls. And when she was born in Baghdad, the second one was born here three years ago. Uh, yep. That's it. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Basilio Zeno. Uh, I'm a PhD student at UMass. Uh, but I came, uh, I didn't, I'm attending asylum since four years, so I'm basically stateless. Uh, uh, the, I didn't come here to the United States as a refugee, uh, but I was doing my PhD in archaeology in Syria, and I had to start uh, from scratch here again. Uh, so I worked at the restaurant and after that uh, I got my master's, I applied for a graduate school in Ohio, I got my master's from there and then both me and my wife got uh, uh, admitted into UMass two years ago, so we started the game. Uh, my brother is a refugee, he was banned and then uh, through uh, Senator Kamala Harris we were able to get him here into the United States. Uh, my sister-in-law is a refugee in California, and uh, my nephew was born in California. Uh, so my brother was extremely vetted for two years, and then he was blocked. After that, we we were able actually to get him here, but he didn't see his kid like for for more than 14 months. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm involved in with many refugees, uh, not just here but also in, in, in D.C., especially pending asylum, because they are in limbo at least since four years. It depends where you are living. Hi, everyone. My name is Yamila Irizarry Gerald. Um, I'm born and raised in Northampton, um, so I'm a native to you all. Um, I studied Arabic for five years and then lived in the Middle East for about four years in Egypt and Jordan. And since coming home about two years ago, I've been very involved with refugees and, and the refugee community around here, mostly is just a friend, um, so, yeah. Good. Can I invite okay. my friend Ahmed up as well? I'm sorry? Can I invite my friend uh, Ahmed up? Sure, of course. Ahmed, it's There's supposed to be another chair back ah, here somewhere. Hey, <laughs> السلام عليكم باللغة العربية آسف أنا ما ما عم بحسن أحكي لغة إنجليزية كويس ما صلي زمان في أمريكا آه اسمي أحمد أنا من سوريا آه جيت على أمريكا تقريبا صلي سنتين. Um, so this is my friend Ahmed. Um, he apologizes for having him speak English. He's only been here less than two years. Um, he greets you all. Um, and he came yeah, again with his family about two years ago. طبعاً من سوريا، أنا سوري، من سوريا. طبعاً جيت أنا وعائلتي، أنا وزوجتي وأربع أطفال، جينا لاجئين، كنا في لبنان، من لبنان على مصر، ومن مصر جينا على أمريكا. اختلفت الحياة كثير، اختلفت الثقافة، اختلفت العالم، لقينا شعب كثير ولود، شعب كثير متفهم إلنا الحمد لله. أطفالي عايشين ب يعني بسعادة ما لقيناها نحن بالوقت السابق وحاليا في المدارس والحياة
الحمد لله اللي عم بيشتغل وامورنا يعني كثير كثير كويس نحن كثير مبسوطين لانه في امريكا <تصفيق> <laughs> so, okay, so Ahmed came two years ago with his wife um, and his four children. Um, you know, they went, they were first in Lebanon, they went from Syria to Lebanon, um, and then they went to Egypt, um, and then they finally were able to come here to America. Um, they are currently in West Springfield, and they're really happy. Um, they, um, the, all the kids are in school. Um, and that they said they found a, a people that were really understanding them, even though things were really different and really shocking. Um, and he just got the screen card. <laughs> so, you didn't forget anything? So, yeah. Okay. So, to start, <clears throat> I just want to emphasize again and again and again. Uh, I think sometimes even well-educated people, Northampton's a pretty educated town, <clears throat> they make generalizations, okay? I'm not saying stereotypes or prejudices, but I think people tend to, we kind of put an image in our mind of who people are and what their background is from and what their needs are, okay? We tend to, not infantilize, but we, we tend to, you know, all these poor people, and this is what they need, you know, and sometimes, they, what they need is not what we think they need, right? And many times you discover that only when they're actually here and you actually meet them. Okay. Can I ask a question of the, sure. the gentleman who came recently here? Just, um, just my question, um, for, and you have been here for the last few years. Um, when you first came, what, what were some of the things culturally that you felt were the most different? Some of the things that you found surprising that you didn't expect about day-to-day -day life and culture? Exactly, just because I worked with the United States government in my country, I spent like four years with them, so I'm not really surprised. And also, just because I speak English when I got here, so even I, the organization to help me when I got here, the Jewish Family Center, no. uh, this organization in Springfield. Uh, so, yeah, you know about some rules. I mean, definitely here I got some different rules and I need to follow it, um, uh, like, like driving. So, you know, it's like a huge difference. So, yeah, but I just started learning that. Now I'm good. So, you wanna say something about it? Uh, basically, uh, so I was actually, back in here, I was working for, with the French all the time, so in, in archeology, span so my interaction, well, my experience would be ex uh, at, at least different from other people, uh, different from my brother, for instance. Uh, but uh, at the same time, one of the things that I found here is, uh, it's not friendly for, uh, like, if you wanna buy stuff, you have to have your own car. So we are heavily dependent on, on our, uh, you know, on buses, on having friends, having everyone else. Uh, but here, I, we, I, I'm still, I don't have a car until now, so it's extremely, I have to choose my location based on uh, proximity to the campus or where, where I'm living. And also, uh, that also is relevant to the question of food. Uh, you know, we have Mediterranean diet, so in order to get your own food, for instance, in Ohio, I had to go three hours to get my stuff from Columbus, which was for me impossible without finding someone. Uh, so I didn't have a community uh, initially in Ohio before my six or seven months. So uh, the very first few months where I was totally lost. Uh, so, but later on it became, now it's much easier. I can't imagine being now in a different country, for instance. Like I, I started to construct this sense of home here. Uh, which is difficult because after the uh, executive order you feel you are in precarious status. So uh, after building your connection with the place, with the community, you, you aren't sure that this sense of home would be endured for forever or for a few years. Like I don't know. Like if you ask me about the future, I don't know the future. So I live day by day because I'm different status, like pending asylum is different than refugees. So we have nuances between each experience. تسأل عن الاختلافات يعني أكبر اختلافات ثقافية أنت شفتها يعني أول ما وصلتوا 
والتحديات الثقافيه الثقافيه الحقيقه يعني انا اجيت من بلد تقريبا مختلف ثقافته كليا عن الثقافه الموجوده هون يعني ثقافتنا بالشرق الاوسط يعني تختلف كثير عن الموجود هون بكل شيء بطرق العيش بالدراسه بالحياه الاجتماعيه بكل شيء في اختلاف لكن استطعت اني اني اتاقلم يعني انا حبيت اتاقلم مع الحياه الجديده الموجوده اطفالي اتاقلموا مع الحياه الجديده في في بلادنا ما في باصات بتاخذ الاطفال على المدارس العامه مثل الموجوده هون ما في ما في وجبات اكل تتقدم للاطفال صباحا والظهر ببلادنا، لكن اطفالي تعودوا لاحظوا الفرق، لاحظوا انه في حياه اختلفت، في ثقافات جديده ان شاء الله تعودوا عليها مفيده لهم، وانا مع ذلك كمان تعودت عليها، وزوجتي تعودت عليها، تعودنا على نوعيه الاكل، على نوعيه الاسواق، بتختلف كثير عنا، وحتى يعني الشوارع، حتى الناس، حتى الابنيه، حتى كل شيء للاحسن للاحسن. Um, so he said that you know where he comes from, he's from um, basically around Damascus, uh, yeah. um, He said you know it's it's incredibly different than here. The, the streets are different, the supermarkets are different, the schools are different. Um, there were no buses that took their kids to school. There's buses that take their kids to school here. Um, they get lunch in the schools. Um, so you know they were. It was definitely very very different, but that he wanted to. Adjust, and he did adjust, um, and you know, it's still in a process of adjusting. He said his kids have adjusted um, quite well, and, and they're used to things, and adjusted for the better. They think. I mean, they think that you know things are better here. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically speaking, um, what I'd urge you to do is a little, be a little careful about. What you read on the internet, you know, and what you, uh, you know, uh, materials you may get that are less than well researched. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, I'm just saying that uh, watch out what you troll on the internet. Watch out what you read. You know, try to find a reputable uh, source for background information if you want to do some background reading. Okay. Um, these cultural orientation. Uh, Things and I'll show you this Center for uh, Refugee. They have a series of refugee backgrounders. These are very well done. They work with the agencies to resettle people. Okay. And uh, can I ask a question? Sure. One of the things that we're really curious about. Yeah, please stand up because it's. So, like, from my accent, the first question, you are from where? <laughs> so when I say from Iraq, so they just start asking me a lot of questions. Sometimes they surprise because, like, I tell them, like, well, actually, and sometimes, you know, they keep asking me for a lot of questions. So, yeah, the people is, like, very nice. And uh, also, like, my daughter, she arrived, she's in the school. She's so happy and she like like she always tell me stuff about the school, like everything's cool and fine, you know. Okay. Good. Anybody else wanna add anything? So uh, <coughs> about helpfulness. Uh, so basically actually there is a huge burden in terms of uh, finance. Like you keep that this is one of the major differences. For instance, education and healthcare in Syria are free. Until now they are free. The quality is different, of course, but uh, here, like, there is, like, you are always in debt. Like, you pay your debt, and then you have to, to pay attention to, like, even at school, we, 
you know, the, the stipend at UMass is 491. So after that, you don't have any financial resources. And as international student or whatever, as bending a salary, you aren't eligible to work. So you have to be by your own self in for three, four months. And you can't receive cash or honorarium or anything. Like, because you have to report them to, uh, to the IRS. And you want to do that, but you can't obtain the EED, which is the work permit, without paying $415. So it's the only country that is charging, actually, pending asylum or any, uh, like, uh, you have to pay for anything. You have to pay for a lawyer, you have to pay for it. So you are always in need for, for money. At the same time, this is maybe a cultural thing. Like, you can't just go knock on the door and please uh, raise donation or you know uh, we need money. Like you get like I don't feel comfortable until now. I don't feel comfortable. I don't have uh, you know uh, religious or traditional things that are constraining them. But I don't feel comfortable in being needy for all the time. And uh, you can't ask people, hey, we need help. But there is at the same time I had this experience with my students and also also other Americans. Uh, there is an assumption that you are receiving funding actually from the government, that you are taking our money. Like since four years, I didn't get a penny from the federal or the government. I can have access, by the way, to the to food stamps, but that is a legal trap because during the interview you would be asked why you got food stamps. It's not your your right, and then you will be dismissed as pending asylum. Your case would be rejected. So there is many uh, legal. Uh, traps in, in, in your path before being uh, you know, uh, a normal human being living. So this is not helpful at, at all. I think the system is not helpful. The, my experience with the American community is extremely amazing. Like, I can, this, like that will counterbalance my, my experience. Like materiality versus you know, spiritually or socially is, is counterbalancing each other. But they don't substitute each other. ولكن <تصفيق> 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 <تصفيق
yeah, yes. tree. He escaped in Egypt, he woke from, up in the United States. Right, right. So he, yeah, he, he one day woke up, was, woke up in Egypt and then was, woke up in the United States. Um, and that he was like a, a you know, he's, he's 40, he said, and he was um, like a, a tree just like uprooted very suddenly and put somewhere else. Um, he said um, a lot of the challenges he found have been around work that people um, want someone who speaks English, um, someone who has the correct licenses and stuff, and his didn't apply here. Um, so he was an accountant in, in Syria, um, so that you know, without English, he wasn't able to do that kind of work here. So um, that was very challenging for him. Um, you know, and then in comparison with his children, um, for whom it was relatively much easier. You know, they go to school, they're thrown into speaking English all the time. Um, so that it's been it's been really good for them to be in school. Um, he also said, you know, um, the other challenges were um, some, you know, the neighbors kind of feeling closed off a little bit, not being very welcoming, um, kind of, you know, just not having a welcoming vibe to them. Um, and of course, kind of going out and getting things done, um, you know, going to the supermarket and that sort of thing um, was, was very challenging. Um, they said the organization that helped them, um, that resettled them, helped, but they had a lot of people to help, right? Um, and that, um, Um, he's, but he, you know, he said it was not as much help as they might have needed, um, and so they they relied on themselves a lot, and um, and they had friends here. They had um, other Syrian friends um, who'd been here a little bit longer than they had, and, and helped them more. You know, I just have yeah. one more. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, you know, one thing. Um, <coughs> Growing up, I, I grew up in Michigan where there's a very large militia community and um, families is huge. And you know, I know my parents in Iraq, they lived together. They're, they were in a duplex and my aunts were next door and cousins were there. I, did, I went to visit once and you know, everyone's just right living with each other next to each other and family is very integral and important. And not that it's not important in the US, but the extended family is just as much part of the family. It's, it has a very, um, they're just such an important role, and you know that's one of the things that I think is probably a huge adjustment, especially coming um, to a community in Massachusetts, where, and in particular Northampton, where there's not a huge Middle Eastern population. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, what what you all think of that as well? How how you adjusted to that, and how you're still adjusting to that? Yeah, I want to say something about this uh, neighborhood. My wife, she likes to cook all the time. So we have like habit in Iraq, so usually when we cook something special, we just give that to our neighbor. So she, I live in apartments, so she started doing that. So she knocked the door, someone opened the door, she gave them like food. They surprised us, what's that? So <laughs> I told my wife, okay, so you need to explain to them before you just surprise them. The manager is my apartment. She just start call my wife and ask her for a specific food. She, she like Arabic food, so always oh, okay. I need to eat that again. <laughs> yeah. So we have a lot of like different uh, habits we usually do. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say that, that this is very important. Uh, you, you probably know that a refugee, by definition, when they hear. They're eligible for public benefits, so you know they do get uh, a form of welfare, okay, for a certain period of time. They, uh, there are, you know, they like a single man doesn't have to go to work right now. I mean, I think you know that basically speaking, there's no welfare for single men anymore. That was abolished back in the 90s, but there are exceptions for refugees. So, so for a certain period of time, you you are able to get certain public benefits if you need help while you're learning English, while you're adjusting, okay? And sometimes when we're working with people in the community, they need to understand that and they need to understand that you, you, you've got to play by the rules if you want to get certain things, you know? Like it's fine to say, I want to give them this, I want to give them this, I want to give them money, I want to do that, you know? Uh, you don't want to do it so that their cash income, depending on how you're gearing it, is makes them ineligible for mass health, right? 
Okay, now you're going to pay for all the mess. You're going to pay for that medical care too. So there are rules. And so sometimes when you're dealing with a, uh, Catholic Charities or another refugee agency, it might seem a little bit frustrated, but it's a tricky thing. If any of you work in social services, you know there are all kinds of rules. So just ask if you're not sure. Okay. Uh, in a way, if you're not a refugee, you can potentially have it harder. If you're an asylee trying to get status, if you're a student, um, even with your education, you might speak English already, but it's tougher. I found down through the years, I've been doing this work since 1994, that I don't know, I, I, I kind of welcome these folks' perspective. But I think in many ways, at least psychologically, it's the more educated you are, the more professional you are in your home country, in one, in one sense it's harder to adjust. It's, it's, it's a bigger shock. You know, I've, I, work with, I started refugee work in 1994 with doing with Haitians, most of whom had very little education, very poor country. They were generally grateful for everything they had and they moved on. <coughs> you know, and now they're doing very well 15 years later. Uh, but if you have a doctorate and nobody will recognize it here and you have to start again, that's harder, you know? So, um, as I was going to say, but, but there are, it is different. If you're a student, if you're, a, if you're trying to get refugee status, it's much more complicated. The, uh, Catholic Charities, where we are dealing with people who have status and they have certain public benefits for a certain period of time, and then as soon as they become financially independent, they don't need all this. Yes, I tend to. I tend to talk about yeah, yeah. So that's just all I'm saying, okay? So I'm just saying there, there are variations in what's happening. Okay, so I don't know if any of you want to address what... Yeah, it's his turn. Sure. Thanks. What was the question? In the... Well, how it feels yeah. coming from a culture where extended family is more common and more comfortable to a place where we live basically very different. So I would disagree with the point about education. Because yes, I started from scratch, but that helped me actually to be more integrated with the community. Because this is how I constructed, I, I feel I have. My friends actually, the way how they jumped in when my brother was banned in Istanbul, that how they stood, just stepped in to cover my sections at UMass, and how really hundreds of people just volunteered to help me and help my family, I can't forget that. And, and, but, that pushed me to think about those who don't have access to other people, those who can't communicate by using English. I was able just, like I tweeted, like in just a few seconds, like I got more than 2,000 uh, retweet, including Al Jazeera, CNN, like, and this is what made my, the story of my brother more visible. But what about those people who don't have access to communication, don't have access to the community? So I think in many ways, I have to acknowledge my positionality here, that my education played a major role in bringing my brother into this country. And so this is one of the things. Yes, I started from scratch. Uh, I should be a professor five years ago because I was writing my dissertation. But I had two options, either to, to be a victim or a survivor. I choose the, the, the other way, which is, which is to be survivor. And I'm proud of what I achieved so far. So the second thing is, uh, mobilizing towards, so my project, actually, my dissertation is about meaning making among refugees in exile. But instead of waiting for someone, as uh, we call it, tourist academia, to just come and interview Syrians or Iraqis and leave, I myself, I can reflect on the pain that we went through. So I don't have to wait for someone else to hijack my voice and write about it. I can, I have a voice. So that's the, the, the other issue. But at the same time, I didn't have community, Middle Eastern community, which made lots of things difficult for me. But at the same time, the negative part played a positive part by uh, forcing myself to communicate more by using English, to work at the restaurant and then jump to school. And I made that decision. So I created a new community. Then I started to help Syrians who want to have access to education. How you did it? You came without anything. So how we can do it? What's the personal statement? What's the GRE? What's the TOEFL? What's the all these? So I'm trying to be a positive 
actor here in the United States by helping other refugees or other st stateless asylee to have access to education by reflecting on my, uh, my personal experience. So I think, yeah, there is a painful part and negative part of that, but also I think there is a positive part too. And thank you for your <laughs> الحقيقة بمجتمعنا الحياة الاجتماعية يعني يعني شو بدي نشبه لك إياها جدا معقدة يعني في ترابط اجتماعي عجيب في العلاقات الاجتماعية عندنا كأمثلة صغيرة يعني لحنا عندنا الأطفال من وقتين بيولدوا في البيت لحد ما يكبروا ويتزوجوا لازم يضلوا في بيت العائلة في بيت الأب والأم حتى لو تزوج الولد لازم يسكن جنب أبوه جنب أمه يوميا لازم الأب والأم يشوفوا الأطفال والأطفال يشوفوا الأب والأم في الأعياد في المناسبات في الأفراح في دائما العلاقات موجودة حتى بين الجيران بتلاقي في ترابط يعني دائما في بعض البعض عزائم هذا بيأكل عنداد هذا بيشرب عنداد في علاقات كتير متشابكة أنا الصراحة هون ما لقيتها والسبب اللي خلاني أنقل من ولاية فلوريدا وإجي على ماساتشوستس هو أني ما لقيت حدا أني عشت هناك وحيد يعني قعدت ببيت بمكان ما في حدا عندي اضطريت أني أطفالي جيب أطفالي وعلى حساب الشخص المسؤولية الشخصية إلى ماساتشوستس لأنه فيها أصدقاء وفيها ناس بعرفهم وبيحسن تزورهم وزوروني لأنه صعب الحياة بدون بدون أصدقاء بدون ناس صعبة جدا ما تنعش um, so he said um, that he's definitely noticed some ajiba, yeah, not strange, but um, interesting, I guess, customs here that have been unusual. definitely surprising to him, sure. But unusual. Unusual, thank you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, he said, you know, there in, in the Middle East, you know, you have, well, not in all countries, and, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of class differences and social differences and religious differences in all of the countries we're talking about, of course, and I mean, just like in America, right? So, um, you know, we have families coming from Damascus, and then we have families coming from more rural provinces in the south, like Dara, um, you know, in Iraq. Um, Baghdad is a city of six million people, so that's like a lot bigger than Northampton and the Pioneer Valley and stuff. So, you know, these are people who, like, they've been in, they, they live in a city, you know? Um, but anyway, so he's, he's saying that in a lot of, um, you know, where he's from, um, the family, you know, the immediate nuclear family, you live with your your parents until you get married. And even when you grow up, when you get married, you know, if the son got married, for example, he'd get a house right next to his dad and, and his, his parents. And he would, you know, they see each other every day. Um, they, weddings, you know, little other smaller um, family events, you know. That's constant. So, um, you know, it's not like you turn 18 and you go to college and you move out. Um, it's really, um, in a lot of um, countries, not like that at all. So, he originally, when he came to America, settled in Florida, actually, um, and then felt very, very lonely there because he didn't have that community that he was used to, and a friend of his um, lived here in Massachusetts, and so that was what brought them up here. And they have, I will say, you know, just as a friend, that they've really built and replicated kind of their community um, their, that they have in Syria. They have a lot of really great Syrian friends and, um, and are, you know, kind of replicating what they had back in the Middle East there, so. I think awesome. there were a few questions. Yeah, let's open it up to some questions, yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, you said that there are some uh, financial, there's some financial help from the government for refugees coming Catholic charities. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong, there's three months, there's like a set amount of money for the first three months, and that's all the cash that there is. That's right. And then there is mass health and food stamps and possibly WIC if there are children. Mm -hmm. But that's it. So it's not like there's an ongoing income. People are expected to be self-sufficient at the end of three months. That, I mean, I know that's unrealistic, but that is... Generally speaking, that's true. Um, a refugee, like anybody else here, uh, is eligible for 
food stamps, um, WIC, things like that, okay, like anybody would. And that's strictly based upon your income. So if you're not making much money, you can get that, okay? Uh, some of the work requirements for welfare, or whatever, whatever it's called nowadays, there are certain breaks because they realize they're just here, they need to learn English. If they're in a program and they're learning English, then they don't cut them off. You know, like you or me, if you decided you're not going to work anymore for no good reason, you know, you're not going to go down to this, you're not going to go down to the welfare office and collect food stamps or or general welfare. Okay, so there's no, so so there's no general welfare anyway. Anymore. But anyway, the point is, uh, there are certain things where there's a little bit more allowance for a relatively short period of time, depending on whether you're involved in a work training program or not. Okay. So, um, you do get that. Um, the whole system, if, if, if any of you are aware of the, uh, the whole welfare reform debate in the 1990s, okay, where everything is, we should make people work, even if they're trying to do five things simultaneously, work, 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 even if they're not well trained for work, okay, that kind of mentality which reform the welfare system, it's kind of a parallel thing that happens with refugees, okay? Um, but uh, the, good part, the good part is, I think we have a pretty good track record the resettlement agencies and the people who are getting them employed. Uh, most people do achieve some, some form of self-sufficiency, I think, okay? I think I think we're getting a little yeah, short on time. That's we it. So we, want, yeah. Yeah. So we can go on another. Yeah, I want to add one more thing about that question for the benefits. Uh, I'll talk about my experience as usually, like when the refugees start work. I start work after three weeks. So after that, we need to send them every six months our paycheck. They, it does depend like in our family, how many people and and how much money you make. So they have like, they will calculate that, then they will just start to reduce your benefits. I mean, at my first month, I even they pay my rent, then they just start paying that, even my food is now, everything, so that's depend on the people. And if they study or it's only work and air all these details. Um, usually the most important thing, the health insurance, because like, with like um, um, myself with my job, I cannot like do that. I, right now I have like a little food stamp and uh, health insurance. The most important thing, the health insurance, I mean, even they will cover everything for my food stamp will be good. Yeah, so we need to report our paycheck every six months just to see if there's any increase in my income, you know? Um, I have two things. One is, I work at the VA, and I want you to know how much vets appreciate what you did in Iraq. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess I wonder about the women who are coming and cultural norms of the Middle East in terms of where women are in the culture and how isolated women might feel here if there is not an extended community. Like, men might go out and get a job, but the women will be in the house. And how can we help with that, being that we're not of your culture? Honestly, that before. I know women different. <laughs> so now, they are work, they, I mean, I'm talking about myself and the people who's around me. Uh, well, if I'm wrong, just say it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that before, like, yeah, before, but right now, everything is different. Like, even in my country, like, even in Iraq, the situation is very hard, but still, like, women go to college, they try to study, they start to work, everyone, there is work, and they, they not stay home at always. Yes, some people, yes, Sometimes the women choose that, and yeah? they, they say, yeah, I want to just stay home, take care of my kids. Um, yeah, but in general, right now, the, they can go outside, do shopping, driving, do wherever they want, so, yeah. Anybody else want to? Yeah, just a quick uh, 
correction actually. Actually, my grandmother in, used to work in Hama, North Syria, like in, since 1950, 1960s. My mother is a hard worker, and she actually, what, until now, she's in Damascus. She's an employee, but she got her uh, law degree when when I was uh, uh, getting my degree in college. Like she decided, like I want a degree in, in college, so. Every single member of my family, every single female member, are worker. I don't recall anyone in my family and family history who isn't working since decades. And maybe if the question about 1930s, 1940s, that might be different historically. But after that, you have whole history that changed, transformed the whole Middle East. The second thing, if we are asking about the specific context of the war now, it actually varies from a region to a region. Like ISIS, Mosul, before ISIS, every woman was working. But under ISIS, they imposed very strict uh, rules uh, that uh, imprisoned women. So it's different. We are treating here a very specific case, and we can't generalize it all. Like within the very same city, we have variances. My experience, I live in Damascus and uh, Ahmed also in Damascus, we have very different experiences, very different. So it's a very tiny place, like uh, maybe the size of Damascus is really little, uh, like, like, Damascus, like uh, Northampton and Amherst together. But uh, that, when you are zooming in, you find all these differences, which is great. I mean, so not to belabor the point, but just I think um, there is so much variation in these countries, and I think it's just our nature to sort of to to try to understand and then stereotype. That's that's the easiest way for us to understand is this is what happens here, and this is what happens. You know, this is how this country is. This is how this country is. But it's just so diverse. Um, and my mother also went to medical school in Iraq. Um, in the 60s and the 70s and, and practice medicine there. Um, I think um, there are there is a lot of variation though. I, um, I work um, in the emergency department and we see a lot of refugee patients more the last several years and I see that in my work as well in that um, a patient may come in and the inclination is to assume that the woman does not want to see a male provider and that the male patients do not want to see a female provider and I've actually, you know, seen that quite a few times and I've gone in to see the patient because I speak Arabic. Of course, you know, it, it makes sense and, and that assumption is completely wrong. And it's very well intentioned and people are trying to be very respectful and sometimes that might be very appropriate, but I would just caution that there is really quite a bit of diversity and, and you know, I think asking is appropriate and, you know, asking people what they're comfortable with and, and, um, and just trying to be cautious of some of the, some of the assumptions and stereotypes. Yeah, question back there? This lady. Could you speak up or stand up? Thank you. I have my sense of this country has changed since the election. You know, my view is going to be a bit of ethnic, and I feel differently in relation to my country. So I'm wondering how you feel and whether you experience more sense of fear and anxiety, and if there's anything that we can do as a community to help you feel safe. You know, I was wondering about my citizenship. I mean, I was wondering if after this election they will change something. Like right now, uh, the refugees after five years, uh, they will be qualified to apply for citizenship. So I was wondering about if they will change something. Uh, and also my brother, he lives in Europe. He lives in Sweden. He has passport, Sweden passport. He has been like there for 16 years. He just applied for a visa two weeks ago and they just denied. They said, no, you cannot go there just because he was born in Iraq. I mean, he's since 2002, he's in Sweden or in Europe. And uh, yeah, so I was wondering about my, and right now I'm still curious if I can apply for citizenship next month. Next month I'll be qualified to apply. I called like many people and asked. Uh, if I need to talk to lawyer or something like that, they say no, just wait, nothing changed. Yeah, so this is the, was the most important thing. And also, I have people they applied for 
for immigrant people and they just cancel their interviews. My friend was his interview in February 25th. They called him and said, nope, you need to wait. cancel them and just wait, like, we'll give you another call and make another appointment. He has five kids, his wife is sick, and uh, yeah, I feel sorry about him. I, today I was talking to him, and he just said, no one knows. And I want to add one more thing. Like, for the people who live in Iraq, believe me, they don't want to come here just to take. They want to give to this community. Like, uh, by the way, I have computer science bachelor degree from Iraq. And I would just like to improve it. I wanted to get a master's degree or whatever, but you know, just I need because my wife she doesn't work. Yeah, so the people who they just need help like a few months, then they will just start work, they will just prove everything. Yep. Yeah, so I'm just, uh, I, I, and, I th and I think. Uh, there's no reason why, particularly Iraqis, all would need to be socially isolated here. Okay, I think uh, you know the, we 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 can get women in the workforce. Obviously, if you have children, you have to work around childcare, things like that. So, I think we can make a lot of progress. If you're talking certain African groups, you need a little bit more training. Language may be more difficult. They may, they may not have the education, but even they are exchanging too. I mean, I've got people from Congo and uh, Rwanda who have education and they're, you know, they're in the workforce and they're kind of mainstream and they've made friends. Uh, sometimes culturally you want to kind of stay in your little, whatever, ghetto or your little, you know, you prefer to deal with your own culture. But once you have the language skills down, it's, it's not a big issue. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, I think. <تصفيق> بس ملاحظة صغيرة عن السؤال اللي سألته الأخذ بالنسبة لإحنا كلاجئين بأميركا وعايشين تحت العلم الأميركي والقانون الأميركي نحترم القانون ونحترم البلد اللي عايشين فيه وبالنسبة للانتخابات هي قرار شعبي أميركي قرار, قرار الشعب الأميركي واللي احنا بنحترمه بغض النظر شو تكون النتائج لأنه هذا قرار خاص فيهم لكن اللي احنا بالناحية اللي بتخصنا إلنا كلاجئين الهالة اللي, اللي رافقت الانتخابات أفزعتنا يعني بخصوص اللاجئين بخصوص إخراج اللاجئين بخصوص منع اللاجئين من الدخول كتير كانت مزعجة بالنسبة إلنا لاحظنا شغلتين أولا لاحظنا يعني في تفهم من 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 طبقات الشعب الأمريكي كلها غير الحكومة يعني الشعب عملنا معاملة غير الحكومة يعني أنا لاحظت في كتير ناس متعاطفين كتير ناس يعني رفضوا الفكرة رفضوا فكرة إنه إنه والله ما يجي لاجئين على أمريكا لأنه منع اللاجئين أو منع دخول اللاجئين لأمريكا هو منع دخول ثقافي بحد ذاته اللاجئ يعتبر مواطن ويحمل ثقافي بيحمل حضارة بيحمل يعني بيحمل شيء له البلد أنت لم تمنعه يعني منعت دخول ثقافة والشيء اللي كمان لاحظنا يعني تصوروا إنه في عائلات تركت أمريكا وراحت على كندا لجوا إلى كندا من وراء الهالة هاي واللي رافقت الانتخابات ورافقت القرارات وبنرجع بنقول القرار قرار شعب واللي إحنا بنحترمه بشو مكان يكون so he says that, um, you know, first and foremost, that they see the elections and everything they see as a choice that this country made, you know, that they respect American law and they respect, respect the American um, public and it's choice. Um, and um, so that was his, his first um, kind of reaction is that they, they're here to respect the law, right? Um, so, but that, of course, the, the um, ban on, on refugees and really, yeah, has shaken them, um, has definitely um, upset them, and that they've noticed um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, a, he wants to stress that the, he really notices a huge difference between the, um, the government and the people, you know, um, and he has really felt an outpouring of, um, of general um, support um, from the community. 
Um, so they, you know, I think, and I, for other friend, um, kind of Syrian refugee friends of mine, um, they feel like they're in a safe place. Um, and generally, they know that this is a, a good area. Um, obviously, there's unfortunately going to be exceptions, but um, they generally um, feel that. Um, but they also know families who are leaving and are going to Canada um, and are kind of, you know, scared in that sense. So, uh, since I'm the one who is in the least assured status here, so uh, thank you for qu your question. But uh, so fear, uh, I lived under Hafs al-Assad and then his son, and I was involved in political activism against the president. And this is why part of the story is I ended up seeking asylum. So fear is part of my identity. So uh, that won't be uh, healed, or like, like this is how I develop mechanism to resist and to survive. So it's not something, always I prepare for the worst. So speaking of that, uh, yesterday was my last day, how did the executive order affected us, all of that. So the University at Rome has secured funding called the Asian funding. Uh, so I, yesterday I taught my last sections because I missed the very first month of the school trying to help my, my uh, my brother, and I had a meeting with the legal office at UMass, and they said there's uh, there isn't anything uh, like I should be prepared for the future. Like I have to consider Canada, for instance. I have to. to so this is why I cancelled everything. They helped me out, but I have to accelerate accelerate my my comprehensive exam like a year before in case I was deported. So. Uh, Canada might receive me or any other country. So I don't want to lose all these four years again. And so, so speaking of fear, yes, I uh, there's no future. Like for, for for like it's different from refugee. It's different from being a green card holder. It's different from citizen. Uh, I am uh, basically I am my document. So when my document, according to the administration, is invalid, so I'm invalid per person in this country. So and that's something that can't be, you know, uh, uh, alleviated through discussion. Oh, don't worry, don't even, no. Actually, basically, we saw that. We, we saw what happened at the airport. So here in at UMass, in Massachusetts, and in California, I feel safe. But I start to observe. The moment I uh, approach the, bo the 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 airport here, I don't speak Arabic. I even speak with my, my, my wife in English instead of Arabic because I am afraid of my language because it's my, my, my skin. So my, my accent is my skin. So the moment I would be, because the only two uh, times that I traveled outside of the US before I sought asylum, I was randomly checked. So two out of two. So I decided not to travel and I sought asylum. So basically, yeah, fear is part of the status that I'm living under. Uh, the new administration. Do other people, we have some more time. Do people want to ask more questions? Do folks have questions? Um, I wanted to ask, um, what helped your children? What did you observe in the schools that um, helped your children? What do they say that they like about friends, about America? Um, what's been helpful? Yeah, I have two girls, uh, just like I say, I'm six, years, six and a half years old and three and a half. So, uh, the younger one, she's in first grade, she's very happy and uh, she likes go school. And that's strange for us because <laughs> it's usually like, uh, school is a little huge different, like Ahmed said, there's like bus, uh, there's like food and uh, it's not only study, they, the people like, it's usually the teacher take care of the kids and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, the little one, Maya, her name Maya, she's in Head Start and also she right now confused between English and Arabic, but she prefers to talk English and uh, yeah, yeah, they are so happy, I, I can say so happy. <laughs> أنا عندي أربع أطفال عندي صبيين وبنتين الولد الكبير بالصف التاسع كتير بحب المدرسة رغم إنه يعني ضاعت سنتين من حياته 
بين مصر وبين لبنان للاسف تشتت يعني الفتره اللي كان لازم هو يكون فيها بالمدرسه للاسف ما درسها ظروف بدنا ننساها ما بدي احكيها نجي للطفل الثاني عندي طفل الثاني معاق يعني معه شلل دماغي وبالتالي هو في المدرسه حاليا كثير مبسوط بالمدرسه جدا يعني يعني انا كنت بتمنى انه يكون في شيء فيديو تشوفوه كيف نحن لما بناخذه عن الصبح بفيق الصبح وبدي يروح على المدرسه كثير بيكون مبسوط ويعني بيمسكني وبيسحبني على الباب مشان يروح على الباص البنتين الثانيين يعني ما بحسن اوصف لك قدر كمان ساعدتهم طول اليوم بيجوا من المدرسه هن عم يرقصوا يعني مبسوطين فبسالهم انا كيف كيفكم في المدرسه كيف ملاقين مبسوطين مع الانسه مبسوطين مع الطاقم التدريسي كلهم مبسوطين في المدرسه ككلها ببناء بالرسم بال بالطلعه مع رفقاتهم بالباص الصباح بالرجعه يعني اختلفت حياتهم كثير وهذا الشيء اللي يعني اللي نساني الوجع اللي انا تركته في بلدي والام اللي عشتها باثناء الهجره ونتمنى ان شاء الله السعاده لكل الاطفال Um, so, as I think you mentioned before, he has four children. Um, his oldest one is in um, ninth grade. And, you know, he basically lost kind of two years between being between Lebanon um, and Egypt, um, but that he loves going to school. Um, one of his children, um, I think the second son, yeah, is handicapped. Um, and he goes to school and he says, he said that he pulls him to the door every morning. Um, that he, you know, really, he's really, really eager to get there. And, that, and they've told me that they've gotten really good services um, in the schools. Um, and then he has two little girls um, and who are also, you know, they're really, really enjoying school. So, you know, he, he says that um, seeing them be happy makes him forget the pain of having left his, his country and uh, his homeland. Do people want to ask any last questions? Um, I, I, yeah, sure. Go ahead. أنا أنا بدراستي في في سوريا كانت اللغة اللي بدرسها نحن بندرس لغتين بالإضافة للعربية، العربية ولغة ثانية أجنبية، اللغة اللي كنت أدرسها هي اللغة الفرنسية، فكنت ما أعرف اللغة الإنجليزية، أنا تعلمت على اللغة الإنجليزية في أمريكا ودائما يعني عيني على على الجدران على واجهات المحلات وبمسك الموبايل وبترجم كل كلمة موجودة عشان أحفظها من اولادي احيانا بحفظ انا وزوجتي في البيت اكياس الاكل شو شو موجود فيها بنترجمهم أه عم حاول قدر الامكان يعني افهم بفهم اللي بيلحقها 90% لكن ما بحسب النطق في اللغه وان شاء الله أه في العام القادم اذا اجتمعنا نفس الاجتماع أه انا بدي اترجم للي موجودين <تصفيق> So he said, you know, in Syria they would study French um, in addition to to their Arabic. Um, so that you know, in maybe a country like Egypt they do study English, but in Syria it was French. Um, so that's the language that he was more familiar with when he came here. Um, he says he learns words um, from his kids sometimes when they come home. Um, reading, he says he's always read, like looking at things and translating it in his phone and um, and kind of memorizing words like that. He understands like a lot. He said. Like something like 90 percent, it's just harder to 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 say things. Um, I we've talked about um, my mom coming in doing an English language kind of thing with 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 adults, you know, like just just really casual, like hanging out in the home thing. So that might be a way that um, you know um, people here in the community can support. Not like an ESO class necessarily, but just like getting together with um, with people in their homes and, and chatting um, and just just speaking. So he said, um, if we do this in a year, he will translate for all of us. <laughs> <laughs>